Obviously, a restaurant is about the food and the service. When the kitchen and the dining room work harmoniously together, memories are created that last a lifetime. To deliver an exceptional experience, both the back and front of the house have to respect each other and be professional. I just come back from Paris and in Paris, I noticed that not only restaurants of high standard are much, much more relaxed than they used to be, but it's also the talk of the town. At the Culinary Institute of America, every chef in training works the dining room to learn the art of hospitality. It's a very nice dessert, a lot of drama at the table. The family will love you when you will make those crepes Suzette. Make sure the flames be careful. Made possible by Aquapana Natural Spring Water. Emerging from a deep spring near the Renaissance Villa Pana, Aquapana is dedicated to bringing the taste, history, and culinary tradition of Tuscany to life. Aquapana, from Tuscany for the art of dining. By Olympus. The Olympus Stylus Tough Camera is made to take whatever life dishes out, in or out of the kitchen. by wine.com. With thousands of wines from around the world, gifts, wine clubs, and the information you need to make a wine selection. Wine.com for wine online. By Cuisinart and the elite collection of food processors. With three nested work bowls, a seal tight lid for maximum capacity use, blade lock for pouring, and a six in one adjustable slicing disc. It's the next innovation for the modern kitchen. High above the scenic Hudson River in upstate New York, the Culinary Institute of America, or the CIA, has been home to many of America's top chefs over the last 60 years. These young cooks come here to learn everything about cooking and working in a professional kitchen. What most of them did not sign up for was learning how to clean glassware and wait tables. Before they received their degrees, they learned the importance of service and come to respect each other, the front of the house and the client themselves. This respect for everything that goes into a successful restaurant produces an inspirational environment for cooks, the dining room staff, and of course the clients. That is what great service is all about. I am with John Fisher, associate professor and maitre d' of the Escoffier restaurant at the CIA. CIA obviously is linked to chefs and, and it's all about food and, and so on. However, the service is very important. The students, almost all of them come here, of course, to learn how to cook because they think they're going to be cooking. And what has happened quite a few times is students, once they've hit the restaurants and they start working in the, in the dining rooms, They'll come to us, to the front of the house instructors, sure. and say, I think I like this better. <laughs> and of course, we encourage them because we need more professional dining room staff than ever in this country. We want to help as a school. We want to help the industry as much as we can and fulfill whatever needs are out there. And one of those big needs now is, of course, the dining in room. In the dining room. I think it's important to remember that, that even though we're a cooking school, Yes. Every famous chef who's graduated from this school was a waiter in this dining room. And in the past, it was more so that the, a truly professional chef would be able to understand what the dining room was like. Because I don't think any chef can be a complete professional unless they have the perspective of what it's like to actually take care of the diners. And, and I've been lucky enough in my career, being a graduate of this school, uh, to have worked with other graduates who were the easiest chefs to work with because they had been waiters in this room. Yes. And I know how to cook, so we could really work as a team better than 
for instance, the, the failed actor who is a waiter and decides, oh, I'm not getting acting jobs, I might as well become a manager. And that's what a lot of restaurant managers ended up being. But whether it's because of the um, change in the business and the fact that American restaurants have been getting more professional, or just because of natural evolution of the, the industry, a lot more of our students are ending up in the dining rooms and providing, I think, much better service than... Well, service is a, a very essential part of the experience when service is impeccable and uh, when the wine service is good and when the food is delicious, it, it creates that very rare and amazing experience that you remember forever. Yes. I think it's very important to have professional waiters and uh, the, uh, the, the, the profession of being a waiter, it's something that is... Uh, beautiful when you do some uh, flambéing and when when you serve uh, tables in an elegant manner. It's not just a job; it's a right. profession. In fine dining, uh, there has always been a level of professionalism in the dining room, and beyond the fact that fine dining has had more professional level of service for all these years, it's starting to trickle down into more casual dining where they're getting more professional in the dining room and the kitchen at the yes. same time. Thank you for doing what you do in exposing those, those students to something that it's not, again, just a job on the side. It's a real profession and you can yes. be very proud of what you do. And we take joy in both exposing the cooking students who are going to be going on as chefs as well as stealing a few for the front of the house along yes. the way and sending them out to the great restaurants and hotels of the country to help our part of the business become more professional. And you promise me you're going to send me some? I promise. I promise <laughs> I will. Hello, guys. Ben, we are in your dining room, and uh, I think nobody realizes when you come to, to the restaurant to eat that there's so much work going on, uh, especially on the morning, the guys preparing the room. We have one captain. We have one captain, we have one front waiter, we have yes. two back waiters and a, and a buzzer. So five people to set up the whole dining room, make sure all the glassware, the china, everything is clean. It's a lot of work that goes into serving a meal. And I think the other day we did an experimentation. We wanted to see how much we interact with the client, including your interaction at the table. Yeah. And how many steps did we count? About 45. 45. 45 times we interact with the client. At the table. And at the table. And the client doesn't realize, because it's not like we are sitting down with the client and talking to them or, or overly asking questions to the clients is totally invisible with serving them and making sure that they have everything they need. It's a, it's a lot of work for the team and um, what I like about uh, the style is that it's totally seamless. I have seen many restaurants where the kitchen staff and the dining room staff don't have really a, a good interaction. For some reason, sometimes it's jealousy or I don't know, the, the cooks like to play with the waiters and... Uh... I must say it's one of the best relation kitchen dining room I've seen and it's, it's really, really a, a very zen relation. Yes. And uh, mostly because of you, actually, who implemented that and it's... Uh, 10 it years ago, really, 15 years ago, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that and it's true, <laughs> absolutely. I was there and uh, it's not, it was not like that, but, it's, uh, but we, it works really well. We have evolved, definitely, absolutely. and, and yeah. we have a great, great uh, relationship in between both. We only changed tonight. The crab appetizer, under the barely touched on the far left, is no longer served with zucchini blossoms, but instead with the uh, shavings of cauliflower. During Things the hours of what we call the service, which really are uh, from 12 to 2 or from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock at night, um, those, are, those moments are very intense and it's a lot of pressure. And we can create even more chaos and pressure on ourselves by being disorganized, by being yelling and screaming and making noise. But it's just tiring and it's not really uh, helping. It's making things more difficult. Uh, therefore, we focus here on working in an organized way, in a quiet and peaceful way. And uh, uh, I make a point of making sure that whoever is in charge of a part of the team, direct the team in a civilized manner. 
and uh, uh, not in an abusive manner because what I don't want is the staff to be uh, terrorized or stressed. Uh, I, I cannot imagine a, a cook being stressed, being able to do good food. You know, it's, it's, it's a discipline that we have and we want to make sure that that discipline is, is applied every day and uh, the results are really amazing. The team we have, which is a big team, uh, we're very lucky to be able to retain them for a very long time. Many people on our team have been with us for a very, very long time. Yes. And people tend to stay. And, and even when we have a new team member, uh, given that most of the team has been here a very long time, they get submerged very quickly into our mentality, how we do yes. things. Everybody that starts in this dining room has a week of training. Uh, after that week, we make the judgment if they are up to stay with us or not, and if they, they have the qualities. But there is a whole week of training, and then there is an ongoing everyday training on the job. Uh, we do have uh, lineups every day. Yes, and, uh, that, and that is very important. The lineup is when Ben interacts with the entire team and delivers the message that he, de he decides to deliver. Today's lineup, basically, because of our uh, new. Uh, additions, new staff members. I just want to reinforce a few points, service points. Basically the welcoming, the sincere welcoming of the guests the moment they walk in. That's either by me or the hostesses. Should be really sincere, genuine. Making them feel very comfortable is important. Somebody who's comfortable at the table, at ease, will enjoy his experience a lot more than somebody who's stressed. So that is your job uh, to make them comfortable. Thank you. Can I get three on eight, please? Four on 25, three on 15. The, the sommelier also are a big part of our team here. Absolutely, for lunch we can go up to two to three sommeliers, sometimes two in the dining room and one in the private room. Yes. And at night sometimes we have all five of them on the floor. Given that we do a lot of tastings with wine pairing, Yes. And that's when the sommelier have a great interaction with the guest. Actually, it's really, uh, you know, they make the guest part of the experience because we have a lot of questions on wine. Why did you pair this course with this wine? And that's when Aldoan is in steps in. Absolutely. Take the time. Absolutely. What is interesting is that the food is very important in a restaurant because you come to have obviously great food when you come to a place like this. The ambience is very important. The decor is important the energy in a room. And the work of the dining room is very important because it's the contact with the clientele. And uh, it, everything has to be working in synergy. Everything, everybody has to be working together hand, yes. to be able to create this special experience to the guest. And uh, it's a very different uh, work that you do up front. But at the same time, it's complementary of what we do in the back. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, in between all the aspects of welcoming the clients, seeing them in a, in a beautiful environment, yeah. serving them uh, and making them feel good and giving After them a great yeah. food, makes a restaurant a great restaurant. We order a crab and a pan de tuna. Yes. Oui. yes. When you go to a restaurant, obviously the food is very important. However, the quality of service will also make your dinner a pleasant experience. And I remember that when I was in culinary school, we used to learn the first year how to cook and how to be waiters. And today we are going to make crepe Suzette. So first we are going to be making the batter, then we will prepare the crepes, and at the end I will show you what we were doing at the time in the dining room, finishing the crepes, flambeing the crepes on the front of the clients. So to make the batter, we need some flour, and I'm gonna pass the flour through the sieve, like that, to make sure that I don't have big chunks of flour for the batter. Then I will incorporate some eggs. So I'm doing a little fontaine like that, a little hole in the middle, and I'm putting the eggs, a pinch of salt, some sugar, and I'm going to incorporate the eggs and the flour slowly to make the crepes. So the crepe is basically a pancake that doesn't rise, it's flat. I'm incorporating now the milk. So we have the eggs, the flour, the milk, the sugar, 
a little bit of salt and you have to incorporate it very slowly to make sure that you don't have any lump of flour in your batter and whisking like that is very important to just incorporate everything. I add a little bit of water too and I'm still whisking making sure that the batter is very silky in texture. I'm gonna melt a little bit of butter and I'm gonna make beurre noisette or brown butter. That will give a nice flavor to the butter and to the crepes. So we're gonna let the butter melt and basically caramelize. I'm gonna add a little bit of vanilla extract into the butter to give extra flavor. Some Grand Marnier, which has a very strong orange flavor. We're gonna grate a little bit of orange skin in it. And a little bit also of lemon skin. It will give extra flavor to the butter again and make it very elegant. And I always like the zest of the orange and the lemon. That gives that nice refreshing flavor. The butter is becoming brown, as you can see. It's caramelizing in the pan. And that will give a nutty flavor to it. And now we just have to let the butter rest for maybe half hour to an hour, and then we will start the crepes. The butter is rested for half hour now. I'm ready to make the crepes. I have a little bit of melted butter and a brush. So when you make crepes, it's very important to use a non-stick pan. And we are going to try to make the first crepe. It's a tradition that the first crepe never really works, but let's see if we can break the tradition and or the superstition more and make the first crepe a success. We let the butter stay and cook, and we're gonna see it's gonna dry inside the pan. Then with the spatula, we're gonna make sure that it doesn't stick to the pan too much. And I think the first crepe's not gonna be so bad. And now we are going to flip the crepe. And the first one will be ready in a few seconds. What you want is the crepe to be moist, not to be dry on the outside, and to have kind of a blonde color. You want also the crepe to be very thin. You don't want the crepe to be very thick. It's not very pleasant when you eat it. And as you can see, it's almost translucid. It means it's the right thickness for the crepe. We are going again to prepare the pan with a bit of butter. Some of our butter now. As soon as the color is becoming, you see, as you see, blonde here, I'm ready to flip the crepe. So it's very important when you do the crepe to have a good coordination in between the right hand and the left hand. Right hand has the right quantity of butter, and the left hand is going to tilt the pan in the right direction to make the crepe thin with a nice also shape. And again, we're waiting for a nice color on the other side. You can also be very playful if you feel confident and flip the crepe like that. And then the crepe goes on top of the pile of the other crepes. And you can do that until you finish the batter way in advance and keep it until you need it for dessert. And now we are going to make our last crepe. Like that. A little bit more on the other side. And the last crepe is going on, the, on our pile. And then the crepes were going in a dining room on a cart where we used to have a little burner like that a nice pan, and we were finishing the dessert side table. So we were starting with a little bit of butter. Actually, we were putting a lot of butter in it. 
and we were adding some sugar in it, making a nice caramel with the butter and the sugar. And of course, not only visually, it was very dramatic, but you had the smell in the dining room. And everybody at the table was stopping, talking and looking at what the waiter was doing. When the butter and the sugar were caramelized, we were adding some orange juice, just like that. You can also, because in a traditional crepe Suzette, you can also use tangerine juice when they are in season, but it's more difficult to find than orange juice. And we were letting the orange juice reduce with the butter and the sugar. So the sauce is made, it has reduced, it's very thick. And we have here exactly the same situation than at the table in a restaurant. I'm going to add the first crepe, and it's always the easy one because you have a lot of space in your pan. And the idea was to fold it like that. And put it aside. Then we were adding another crepe in it. And the idea was to toss the crepe in the sauce, then folding it again in little triangles. Another crepe. And folding it again. And I feel like a maitre d' right now, or like a captain. We're gonna add another one. Of course, we were not touching the crepes with our hands. It was all, always touched with the fork. And I'm gonna fold the last one. And toward the end, we were adding Grand Marnier. Also, in a traditional recipe, you can use Curaçao, but Grand Marnier is very nice because it has this very sweet orange flavor. And we were adding it on it, like that. And flambéing. <laughs> and of course, you can always do that at home making sure that you are careful with the flames. You just don't want to burn down the kitchen or the house. The crepes are going in a plate. And in the dining room, we had to work very clean. The plate had to be very nicely um, plated and sauced. We were adding a little bit of the sauce like that. A little bit of the sauce around. And then sometimes we were adding a scoop of ice cream. And it was a very nice addition to the crepe Suzette, like that. All the alcohol has evaporated. Therefore, children can have the dessert as well. And now it's my turn to indulge. This is a great fun dessert. It pays homage to the cooking in the kitchen, but also to the service at the table. And it's really a lot of fun to eat crepe Suzette at home with the family. Santé, cook from life. This offer is not available in stores. Eric's latest book, Avec Eric, is the companion to his Emmy award-winning TV series. Filled with over 100 recipes, it captures Eric's adventures in stunning photographs and takes you to the source of inspiration. You will also receive a three DVD set of the new season of Avec Eric, including 13 perfect pairings episodes with Aldo Sohn. The cost for all of this is $44.99, a savings of 25% off the list price at avecerec.com TV. To order, call 1-866-469-ERIC. Thank you.
For more culinary inspiration with Eric, visit his website for free access to recipes, exclusive wine pairings and videos, and download Avec Eric multimedia and mobile apps. Join the Avec Eric community. Log on to AvecEric.com. Made possible by Aquapana Natural Spring Water. Emerging from a deep spring near the Renaissance Villa Pana, Aquapana is dedicated to bringing the taste, history, and culinary tradition of Tuscany to life. Aquapana, from Tuscany for the art of dining. By Olympus. The Olympus Stylus Tough Camera is made to take whatever life dishes out. In or out of the kitchen. By Wine.com. With thousands of wines from around the world, gifts, wine clubs, and the information you need to make a wine selection. Wine.com for wine online. By Cuisinart and the elite collection of food processors. With three nested work bowls, a seal tight lid for maximum capacity use, blade lock for pouring, and a six in one adjustable slicing disc, it's the next innovation for the modern kitchen.